Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Well, here we are for a review of Doctor Who Season uh, 1, sorry, Season 12, Episode 8, The Haunting of Villa Diodati. As a non-spoiler review, I can tell you that this was a pretty good episode. It's a good setup, certainly, for the next two episodes that are going to be the season finale. It's not got the SJW wokeness that generally tends to bash you around the head with a baseball bat. It does stand out as a pretty good episode throughout, and there's a lot of history in here, by the way, that uh, is being kind of played with, um, that uh, either if you know the history or you don't, maybe, I'm not sure which, uh, may make this a better or worse episode. I am going to go ahead and break down some of that history in this, uh, in this review. But it was a good episode. It's not a great episode, but it is one that you can watch and generally enjoy yourself. So, uh, for those of you who are new to me, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not like other reviewers. I do not sit down and just rehash the plot and pause to tell you what I thought, liked, or didn't like about the plot. I go into a lot more depth than that. Um, I will go, touch on everything from acting, directing, cinematography, anything having to do with the mechanics of making a film. So we will just take it as read that if you've come here looking for a review, you've already seen, you know, Doctor Who, Season 12, Episode 8, The Haunting of Villa Diotati. However, um, or you just don't care if you have it spoiled. How, but however, for safety's sake, we should probably issue a spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a fan die master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. Now, that's not a boast or a brag. This is just where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years' worth of science fiction. The problem with all fan die masters is that we are cursed. You simply can't see this new stuff for the whole century that came before, and you find out that there isn't that much that's actually original, and sometimes it interferes with your ability to enjoy things. I also do not do outrage reviews. There are a lot of reviewers out there that are simply actors portraying outrage because outrage sells. They hate everything as just a knee-jerk reaction because the viewers want to watch them hate things. Now this causes a really weird feedback loop between fans and popular reviewers where ultimately nobody likes anything, even if it's good. So I don't do outrage. I don't do it. If I like something, I will tell you why in detail. If I dislike it, I will say why in detail. But I don't do outrage. Unlike all the other reviewers, I am the adult in the room because I am a fan die master. So the review of this, the shortish, longish review. I always like to talk about great moments before I get into anything else. I always like to try to say something nice about something, even if I, uh, you know, hate it in general. And I didn't hate this one in general. When I go through my cringe moments, which I do next, you're going to find that most of that is going through actual history of what went down at this time period. And maybe that'll make the episode better or worse for you. I don't know which. But in terms of great moments, well, one great moment was there were no massive SJW moments beating you around the head with a baseball bat just to give you the moral of the story. However, the fact that there are no great SJW moments is probably indicative of my current expectations for this show because my default position has now become, well, what SJW nonsense are they going to throw at us this week? So we didn't have much of that, any of it really. There was a couple of moments that you could maybe call that, but it mostly wasn't there. So good for them, no SJW stuff. One of the things I did like was the 19th century writers not uh, being able to fall for the doctor's psychic paper. I thought that was kind of fun. We have seen this before with people who are either trained to be able to look past it or that have some exceptional abilities. It's fun that this group was then just immediately telling us these is a group with an exceptional ability to be able to, uh, you know, not have to not be able to, uh, you know, see through the psychic papers. So that was kind of nice. Uh, I liked Graham's attempt to use the 18th century uh, grammar. I thought that was nice and funny. And the doctor says, don't, don't do that. No, don't do. 
Uh, we know from other episodes, of course, that the TARDIS translation matrix completely compensates for different languages. So like when Donna was trying to speak Latin in ancient Rome, it came out as sounding Welsh to the Romans. I did like the house being sort of a you know massive perception filters. I thought that was very nice with both a callback uh, and a natural extension of what we've already seen of that science. We always like to see that. We like to see how the science is moving forward. So I liked that very much. I liked it a lot. Uh, placing the doctor in a position of having to make a moral choice about the future of humanity was very good. This is something that Doctor Who has really excelled at in, since 2005, and we should have been seeing more of it in Chibnall and should continue to see more of it in Chibnall long before now and continuing. I do have cringe moments, but again, a chunk of this is going to be me going over the real history of what was going on at this time in this place with these people, because it's a little bit more convoluted than you might imagine. The episode was then set in 1814. A um, couple of things that come off the top of my head because I've talked about it before and they continue to assume that it just doesn't matter. And really it should. It really should matter. Now, there are problems just in terms of realism because of this. This is a time period when women were considered second-class citizens. You know, we get into a problem here that any time before about the beginning of the 20th century, any time before that, women are second-class citizens and the doctor should not be listened to or be put in her place if she tries to say anything out of turn. However, we can say to ourselves, okay, well, you know, these particular people are much more enlightened, you know, particularly considering the women involved in Mary Shelley and all that, much more enlightened people. So, you know, maybe they're okay with, you know, the doctor being the one she is calling all the shots. The other thing is, while slavery had been abolished in England and Wales in 1722, I am not clear with what regard black people were held in 1814, only 25 or so years later, uh, maybe close to 30. But in any case, you know, in this case, we could say, okay, well, these are more enlightened people. They're okay with a black guy being around and treating him more as an equal. But this is also something that should be a huge deal particularly prior to 1877 in Britain, because slavery was a thing, you know, and having a black guy around during that is should be at various times problematic. The writers are going to have to stay away from periods in time which Ryan would have been considered a slave. Now, the relationships between these period characters, the ones that we see, you know, that are here, that they come to see, was generally difficult to follow in general in the, in the episode, and that's because, <laughs> man, these people had a very convoluted relationship to begin with. And if you don't know their history, if you don't know the real history and a lot more about it, what we're seeing here is really some very extreme shorthand of what was actually going on and taking some liberties with the timing. So here is an actual outline of what was going on with these characters, and try to stay through and move with this because it gets weird. So in 1814, Mary, she began a romance with Percy Shelley, and he was already married. So along with her stepsister, Claire Claremont, which who we also see in this episode, the three of them started traveling continental Europe to be away from his wife. <laughs> and when they returned to, to Britain, uh, Mary was pregnant then with Percy's child. And because of the uh, mores of that era, they were ostracized, they fell into debt. And uh, then Mary had an, attempted to have another child, and it was born prematurely and died. So Mary and Percy, they ultimately married in 1816, two years after this episode, when Percy's wife, Harriet, committed suicide. And the episode, of course, is set in 1814, during the time that the couple weren't married and they were traveling Europe. And they had spent then an entire summer at Lord Byron's Villa Dietati, um, in which Mary Shelley, she described in her own words as, quote, it proved a wet, un, um, uh, sorry, ungenial summer, and incessant rain often uh, confined us for days to the house. Now, in the background of all of this, and this was happening during this episode, Claire Claremont was already pregnant with Lord Byron's child, and this would have been out of wedlock. Now, scholars say that sitting around the fire at Byron's Via, the uh, company amused themselves uh, by uh, telling old um, German ghost stories, which once prompted Byron to suggest that they each write a ghost story. Now, also present was Dr. John um, uh, uh, Polidari, um, who is seen in this episode, 
who is portrayed here as something of um, you know a coward and a cad. I don't know if that's the way he was in real life at all or not. I have no idea. But unable to think of a story, young Mary became anxious and stated later, quote, Have you thought of a story? I was asked that every morning, and I was forced each time to a mortifying negative, end quote. So uh, during uh, one late June evening, the discussions turned to the nature of the principles of life. And Mary suggested that perhaps a corpse could be reanimated. And it was after midnight before they retired and unable to sleep, she began obs being obsessed by this imagining she had be this sort of waking dream of her ghost story, this what would become Frankenstein. And it was on this June evening that this story takes place. Only this time, it was the doctor who proposed they write ghost stories. This time, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, or the, or the modern Prometheus, which is the full title, by the way, uh, Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. This was inspired, obviously, by the Cyberman. And by the way, one might also note that her use of Prometheus when talking to the Cyberman is a nod to the fact that the full title of that is Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. Frankenstein, the novel itself, is in the public domain and can be found on Project Gutenberg. I have a link to it in my description box. Please go read it. It is a classic. If you know only the films that you've ever seen, you do not know Frankenstein. Those films tend to be only loosely based, generally, on the book. Um, this uh, episode also, towards the end, sort of makes an implication that maybe the doctor was at least in part responsible for, for Lord Byron's poem, Darkness. And that poem is also linked to below. I suggest you read it. Um, the people involved in all of this were very well-known writers. And this is one of my cringe moments. One would think <laughs> that they would document this event much more closely than just basing Frankenstein on the Cyberman. I mean, you would think it would appear in personal notes or journals, even if they'd not written about it directly. And in any case, the event would have been worthy of some kind of serialized, you know, fictionalization, <laughs> I think. A bit of a cringe moment, Percy, Percy Shelley being able to manipulate all these perception filters in the house, this appeared to be on some sort of conscious level for him, certainly influenced by the thing, the MacGuffin thing that was inside of him. But one would think that a writer would write something about that incident, at least in his own journals or personal notes, which everyone kept at that time. Cybermen, able to travel through time, even with difficulty, is a new development, and obviously an extremely dangerous development. The Daleks got time travel technology, and that's when everything went completely to hell. It was totally for the worse, and ultimately it led to the last great time war. Another cringe, the doctor meeting her companions, uh, or uh, her doctor um, taking her companions, rather, to meet these particular people on this particular night would seem out of character. I sure as hell wouldn't touch it with a 10-meter cattle prod. I mean, why in the world would you go to the particular evening that Mary Shelley was inspired to write Frankenstein? Wouldn't some other evening or some other day have been a lot less risky to the timeline, you know? Catch them when they're out. I don't know, having a tea party or something somewhere, having tea. Not not the night, the important night. <laughs> also, not precisely a cringe moment, but the idea that Mary Shelley would get the idea for Frankenstein from the Cybermen makes this a predestination paradox. Because for her to have gotten the idea, not only would the Cybermen have had to have been present, but also the doctor would have to be present to make sure that everybody survived. So we have a predestination paradox here. One wonders, too, and I hope it's going to be uh, resolved in the final two episodes of the season. Captain Jack has known, we saw him talk about it in The Fugitive of the Jadoon, that this particular moment would come. And he must have let, known that the doctor couldn't possibly have let Percy Shelley die due to the ramifications that his death would have on the future. Um, how did Captain Jack even know this was going to be a problem? I mean, hopefully this is going to be caught, paid off by episodes 9 and 10. Uh, for that matter, hopefully the issue of the unknown past Doctor, Ruth, will also pay off in the episodes. Uh, hopefully, for that matter, the whereabouts of the Master and why he destroyed Gallifrey will also pay off in episodes 9 and 10. Uh, in fact, IMDb, the copy for IMDb, uh, uh, 
ad copy that's on IMDb for episode 10, actually, the name of the episode is The Timeless Child, which is something that the master specifically mentioned. And um, I continue to wonder if this isn't some kind of implementation of what, what Huvians call the mas Cartmel Master Plan. The Cartmel Master Plan. This would have been an arc that would have involved the seventh doctor had that series not been canceled at that point and then gone on hiatus until 1996. Uh, I will not spoil this for you by talking about the Cartmel Master Plan. There is, however, a link to it in my description box below if you want to learn more about it. So, good and cringe out of the way. Again, I thought this was generally a pretty good episode. Um, not a great one, but a good episode. You know, it didn't have most of the pitfalls that we usually see. But I always like to talk about the writers first, because without a script, you ain't got nothing to shoot. Anything in the story, good or bad, is ultimately the fault of the writer. And in this case, the writer is Maxine Alderton. She has been active 2008 to present with three writing credit credits, 116 episodes of Summerdale. You have to understand when I say one, three writing credits, that's what shows up in IMDb. But one writing credit, as in this case represents 116 writer credits on the TV series Summerdale and uh, three writing credits on The Worst Witch. She has one script editor credit that translates into 20 episodes of Emmerdale and um, this is her own only Doctor Who so far. She has won an award, the British Screenwriters Award in 2017 for Bre Best British Children's Television for The Worst Witch, which is to some extent, I didn't research it really hard, but I think to some extent it is what we call in genre, you know, science fiction, fantasy, superheroes, etc. The genre that I generally cover in genre. So uh, I think partly um, that's probably partly why she was hired because she has that experience and also she has a lot of experience writing for that uh, uh, Emmerdale, that's some kind of uh, uh, soap opera. I didn't look at that any further than that. But very importantly, this does not have Chris Chibnall's SJW fingerprints all over it, nor the baseball bat with the message that is bashing us upside the head all episode long. And oddly enough, Alderton is not one of Chris Chibnall's former associates, which he does some a lot of, which also may explain why the episode was largely SJW free. Um, her writing here is very good. The story flows. It has its ups and downs. It has its, you know, it has generally a four-act story structure like you always see the, that's really popular. Has always been popular since the ancient Greeks. Um, it has moments where we, d you know, what we don't get here most of the time, and this is something that differentiates it. This is a British telling of basically a ghost story. There is now a massive difference between the way uh, the British tell a ghost story versus the way the Americans tell a ghost story. American horror movies now are just jump scares. That's really about all they amount to is jump scares. And that's just cheap and crap writing. You try to, in a, in a good horror movie, you're building up some tension, not just showing a close-up of somebody whipping around, ah, it's a monster. It's a jump scare. You know, here we have tension building. It's, it's very, very British that way. Very different from the way an American might approach this. This is a ghost story written from a British perspective. And it's much, much more interesting as a ghost story that way. It's not just jump scares every five minutes. You know, I, jump scares are lazy, 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 lazy writing. This is good writing. This is telling a good ghost story in a British sensibility, and it's very, very good. I invite you anytime, because I've reviewed some of them, go back and watch some of the old Hammer films of like, for like uh, Frankenstein, Dracula, they made a ton of them. You can see the difference. These are, these are horror stories told from a British perspective that is a hell of a lot more interesting than today's modern perspective. It's all in, in you know, in the US, it's all jump scares, just jump scares. Ugh. Ooh, that's all, just jump scares. This is a good ghost story told from a British perspective, and I like that. We get into the acting. We have Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. I have said this before. I will say it again, probably throughout the entire tenure of Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. After watching you fangirls squee about the Doctor for over a decade, I take some smug pride that it is finally my turn. Whitaker is obviously a beautiful woman, but that is not what gets my attraction. I really have no time for stupid women. 
Um, you got to have brains if you want to get my attention. You know, uh, Kardashians, yeah, okay, they're cute, but they're stupid. They're dumb as bricks, and I want nothing to do with that. I want my women to be intelligent. Hell, I'll take an unattractive woman who's intelligent. Just look at my own dating and marriage history. I'd be happy to take a unattractive woman or reasonably attractive woman who's intelligent any day over some stupid airheaded supermodel and trust me i've known a few but jody whitaker has rarely been put in situations where her brains have been particularly required you know and and it reduces her in my eyes to simply a beautiful woman when she is given something to do that is smart that is when i get into her and find her sexy there were several moments where I thought she was sexy in this episode. So when dealing with the Cyberman alone and then deciding what to do about this MacGuffin, let Shelley die and change basically all of human history for that period forward, or give the MacGuffin over to the Cyberman and maybe have something even worse happen. Um, that's a smart decision, and I like that, and that makes her a lot more sexy to me. There were great moments of both brains and uh, internal conflict that actually allowed Whitaker to use her talents as an actress. She is typically underutilized completely, and when she uses it, well, I find her really, really sexy. So take that, you fangirls. Blah. Bradley Walsh says, Graham, as always, Graham continues to be my favorite character. He is extremely likable to me. He generally has his head on straighter than the other companions. This is probably due to his age and experience. You guys may say, okay, boomer, but um, just you wait. By the way, I'm not a boomer. I'm early Gen X. So if you say, okay, boomer to me, I'm going to say to you, okay, doomer. Um, but in any case, you know, you say, okay, boomer, um, guess what, guys, you're going to get to be that age, too. And guess what, guys, you're going to find out that what you think right now is incredibly stupid. I know that I think that what I thought at age 20 was incredibly stupid. I know that what I thought at age 40 was incredibly stupid. I'm pretty sure that if I live to be 100, I'll think that what I think right now was incredibly stupid. With age comes wisdom, and Graham has it. Um... Frankly, I wish that they would dump Graham, all the other companions in favor of him. I think it would just be Graham and the Doctor would be fine. It would allow for character development in the companions and the Doctors. The problem is, with three companions and the Doctor, you have four people spread out over only ten episodes. So there is no time for any real character development for any of them. But Walsh's performance is what gives Graham his likability, and another actor might not be able to accomplish it so well as uh, Bradley Walsh. And as usual, Graham doesn't get any real character development, but then nobody else does either for the reasons I've mentioned. However, he is, along with the other companions, a catalyst for action and sometimes an info dump. And when that's necessary, Graham can pull it off as in character. And so that'll, that's always important. Being able to pull off the info dumping and the uh, being a conduit for other action is important. Justin Cole as uh, Ryan. Again, he's fine here. Um, there's really no character development for him, but like most of the companions, he's either used for exposition or as a catalyst for other action. And in that respect, he does it well. You know, if, if that's what you're given to play, he does it fine. There's no, no point at which I say, ah, I don't believe you. You know, bad actors, you go, I don't believe you for a second. But a good actor can do it, and he pulls it off. Amanda Gill as Yaz, again, she is really not much there for character development. She facilitates someone else's uh, character development, but she doesn't have much of her own. Um, like the other companions, she's mostly used as info dumps or catalysts for other actions. And again, you know, you look at it, well, she, she plays that well. There's nothing wrong with it. I don't disbelieve her. She's fine. Doesn't get a moment to shine, really, but she's fine. Maxim Baldry as Dr. John Polidori. Um, I really have no idea whether the guy was this kind of, you know, cowardly SOB as he's portrayed here. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I have no idea. I, you know, there's only so much history that I can look up and make sense of, and the relationship between these characters was hard enough. But I have no idea uh, how he was in real life. 
Um, the actor playing him did a fine job of portraying him. There was nothing uh, bad here. I, I got a kick out of the fact, you know, that he was so cowardly that he, he cowered behind a woman. For a moment there, I thought that may have been an SJW thing, but then it came back at the end about what a coward he was, and I was like, okay, perfect. Because at that time period, man, if you did not put the woman behind you, if you're a man who didn't put the woman behind you to protect her, you were one cowardly SOB. Um, so I totally believe him as a coward here. Even I don't, again, don't know if the human being he's betraying actually was. Lily Miller as Mary Wollstone Godwin, later and Mary Shelley, much later after this. She's very good at playing someone both interested in the terrifying stories, being terrified herself when things happen, and also being compassionate with the Cyberman uh, until it kind of goes south on her. Um, but again, no problem with this uh, performance. I think she's very good here. Um, of the bunch, she is probably one of the two that have real character development. And, uh, you know, she does that well. But again, when you're in an hour show that is essentially a ghost story, having much character development for much of anybody when you've got that many characters running around is just about impossible. It's it's one of the things that's... I don't, I don't think that they should go back to, like, classic Who, where you had, you know, half-hour episodes twice a week that were, you know, where the... the whole story might be four to six or even eight episodes long. I don't think you should do that. But one of the things about doing that is you did have time for character development for almost everybody. In this case, given the fact that they have hourly, weekly episodes, I think they should have 12 episodes per season and have only the Doctor and one companion. Then you have time for your character development. You have time for the characters, the guest characters, to get involved with them and see how that rubs off on your main character's character development. It's what they've done since 2005. And Chidnall's just abandoned it completely because he's got too many characters. Jacob Collins Levy as Lord Byron. Well, he certainly comes off as someone who's a member of the aristocracy. There's no question about it. Instantly, instantly, aristocracy. Whole air of us aristocracy right around him. Uh, while his performance is good, his uh, character really is, again, only used for uh, exposition, except at the tail end when he's reading his poem, Darkness. Uh, again, it may just be, you know, I, I've not seen this actor before, but he's certainly pulling off being an aristocrat and not in a joke way. He is an aristocrat, and it feels like it. So good on him. Louis Rayner as Percy Shelley himself. Now, while we don't see him for very long, his portrayal of someone largely terrified while an alien database invades his brain, is very good. Nadia Parks as Claire Claremont. I uh, mentioned the real history behind this character before. Um, you know, good as questioning her relationship with Lord Byron, which, again, was icy at the time. However, historically, she did not break off her relationship with him until much later in her life. Uh, but again, her playing that you know, questioning the relationship, which she may have questioned. It was icy at that point. She may have been questioning in real life. But again, it did not end at the end of this episode. It did not end at that night. It ended much later in history. But again, good performance from her all the way around. Patrick O'Kane as a Shad the Cyberman. This is really the only time, aside from Bill, that we've seen a Cyberman who's been damaged or unfinished or is still has some residual memory. Um, and that's, uh, that's a nice little thing to see, um, the idea that there even could be somebody like that. Um, but ultimately, of course, not that it matters, he is ultimately still a Cyberman. However, I have no complaints with the actor, and I, and I understand this was to some extent a plot device. You know, we're saying, okay, here's where Mary Shelley got her idea for Frankenstein. It's from this half-finished Cyberman, somebody who was reanimated from the dead, or more or less. Um, so, you know, even as a plot device to get the MacGuffin, he still works very well, and I totally uh, believe him the whole time. Director on this episode was Emma Sullivan. We have seen her most recently, last, last episode in Can You Hear Me? Her direction here is very good. I very much like the direction because, again, this is a British ghost story being told. It is not a stupid American horror film where it's just jump scare after jump scare. This is setting up moods. This is setting up lighting. This is doing simple things like 
zooming into a doorknob as it starts to rattle. This is the sort of thing that builds up, that builds tension, and the direction was good for that. It, uh, it really helps build the tension. You know, the shots when you had multiple characters in it and maybe one would just disappear because they turned off their, you know, snuffed out their candle, that was great. You know, the use of shadow and light and how that set the mood, very, very good all the way around. I liked her direction very much. Cinematographer was Ed Moore. We have seen him in four episodes of season 12, most recently last week's Can You Hear Me? Now, my regular viewers have heard me say this before. I'll say it again as quickly as I can. Um, the director's job is to say, I want to get these shots. The, the cinematographer's job is to say, I can get you those shots. But then sometimes something may happen on set, or maybe the cinematographer's thinking about the shot, and they say, hey, you know, director, if we do this just a little bit differently, if we take maybe advantage of something that's in our environment, maybe a little lighting differently, we can make this a little better, a little more dramatic. I mean, we can, same shots that you're talking about, just maybe a little slightly tweaked. And so they may get together and they'll think about it for a while and come back and go, yeah, that's a good way to do that. Now, I don't know if that's happening here. The best place that I can tell you about it is in the 1978 Superman movie. There was a clear, clear collaboration going on there. But here, the cinematography, either way, is very good. Um, while the episode is lit very dark, because we're dealing with a time period during which candles were the primary source of illumination, so it's, it's lit very dark, but we can still see and make out everything that we need to see and getting the shots that the director wants in a way that we can still see that is harder than you think. You, know, you can't just give your ca characters candles and let them run around because you'll get shadows in funny places, you won't be able to see their faces clearly, and it'll just be a mess. So you have to be able to do lighting in a darkened situation that gives the mood that you want, that feels like it's being done by candles, but at the same time, you can actually see the action, see the characters. Best way I can describe this is compared to any episode of Batwoman, which is the next thing I'll be reviewing and should come out probably before midnight central time tonight. And uh, you can see the difference instantly. They do everything in darkness there, and it's just black. You can't follow anything. And they use, again, the darkness and the shadows in order to set the mood, to you know, build a tension, to reduce it. It's all very, very good. It was just generally well shot, well cinematographed, done, well photographed all the way around. It was, it was great. Production designer was Defeat de Schumer. We have seen him in multiple episodes of the, the Chibnall era, most recently Kerblam. The production design here. Now, this was what we kind of call a bottle show. There was only one real major location that is in this house. So uh, they're building sets that are supposed to correspond with the interior of this house. But the sets were very good because we got an opportunity to see things like going up a set of stairs, coming around the, for the, at the landing, and realizing you've just gone out to this exact same stairs. Or, you know, going out a door, walking down a hallway, walking back in, and oh, I'm back in this exact same room. Um, so being able to do that, being able to do that set design, being able to do it so that it looks like it was a villa in 1814, you know, uh, a good period piece. That means that either, you know, the person who's doing the production design already has some experience doing those or knows how to research it properly so that it looks accurate for the period. Now, I'm no expert on that period. I, I've done some stuff in period uh, pieces like that. And I, uh, my um, longtime viewers probably know that a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor, and so I've done some period work like that, but I'm by no means an expert, expert in it. But nothing came out, popped out of me that looked like it was, uh, you know, necessarily anachronistic. I do wonder something, by the way. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, Graham running around looking for a, a, a bathroom. I don't know for sure how things worked in you know upper class villas like this, but at that time period, the bathroom was actually an outhouse for most people. I don't know if they had any interior on um, at that time period. So I don't know how it worked back then. But I, I think his looking around for one may have just been him expecting to find one when in fact it was in an outhouse. Music, as always, Sagun Aganola. Now, IMDb also lists a score mixer, which I probably think, as I say oftentimes, the music was 
cues that Akinola had previously written and that were mixed together for the episode. And that's not uncommon. There is not an unlimited budget for music, so they can't write music for new music for every single episode. They tend to save it for the episodes they think are going to be the most dramatic and need the most new scoring. So then what they do is they take score cues that have already been reused and they edit them together in such a way that they make sense for any given episode. And hopefully we will be able to hear some more new original cues for episodes 9 and 10 because those certainly look to me like one of the ones between, between the first two episodes and the last two episodes. I think those are the ones that are going to need the most new music because of what they have dramatically going on. However, there's a weird deal that goes on in my head that makes this music not all that great. Um, it's forgettable to me. And I don't dislike it, but it doesn't stick in my head the way that Murray Gold's music did for 10 years. Now, i got to get into something a little weird that not everybody shares this way. It's a question of how the human brain processes information. Now, a lot of people, I would say the majority, probably have something that we call an inner dialogue. It's basically just words that are streaming through your heads at all times that you probably hear on some level. Um, and we, what we choose to say is based on an edited version of what we were having on our inner dialogue, right? Now, I have an inner dialogue that consists of both French and English um, by virtue of my having become fairly uh, proficient and at one time fluent in French at a fairly young age. And part of my inner monologue still comes out in French sometimes. But I also have an inner dialogue, an inner monologue that consists of music. It is almost exclusively orchestral film music, which is influenced, no doubt, by my collection of over 400 soundtracks. Lots of people tend to get music stuck in their head, and they can't turn it off. But mine plays constantly, and I can, in fact, alter it anytime I want. Kind of like my head's my own internal iPod. So the issue with Akinola's music is that my inner soundtrack finds it forgettable where for the 10 years prior to that, um, Murray Gold's music was just part of the collection. Um, I've uh, yeah, not actually listened to Gold's uh, music on soundtrack collections, which means that it is so memorable that while I get it just while listening to the episode, you know, the fact that it's good music and sticks is a sign that it's very good. But, you know, having an un- memorable score like Akinola's means that it's just something that fits the action rather than being something brilliant that comes out. Special effects supervisor is Sheila Wickens. She is effects supervisor for this entire season. As always, the real work for any time you have an effects heavy show like Doctor Who is done by an army and it is impossible to attribute any one effect to any one person. Um, and with modern CGI, of course, one really only notices if the effects when they're bad. And there was certainly nothing bad here. It was all realistic. It was all appropriate. Good effects, you know. Uh, there were no doubt a lot of green screens you were in places that you didn't expect. Now, certainly any shot where there was a window, either as part of the immediate framing in the background or just as something that was off in the background in the back, um, it was green screen. It's, you know, it's impossible to have any exterior environment like outside the house without a green screen these days. So wherever the green screens were, they were executed flawlessly. And any place there were green screens where you didn't expect it, well, you didn't know. <laughs> so they must have been executed very well. Costume designer, again, was Ray Holman. He is costume designer for all of this season, most of the last uh, we have seen him as a costume designer all the way back since 2007's episode Blink. Now, I'll say it again, as I often do, but it's good for my new viewers. A costume should tell you something about the character. For example, people make, real people in real life, make qu ch um, various choices about what they're going to wear every single day or even several times a day, or what you're going to wear when you go out on a date. You make all of these choices about your clothes, and what you choose may not be the same as what the next person next to you does. So, for example, if you saw me out in the street during the day, I'd be wearing some kind of de geeky t-shirt. Today it was my NASA t-shirt again, uh, combined with jeans. That'll tell you something about what kind of person I am, kind of a geeky guy. And uh, like right now, I am wearing a costume. Nobody, I, and I don't mind telling you this, there are lots of people out there who are doing the same thing, particularly 
female YouTubers who have positioned their cameras highly enough so that you can see cleavage down the center and are wearing a shirt that will allow you to see the cleavage. That don't happen by accident. I am covering up a couple of different things about my weight because my camera is not directly in front of me. This would be directly in front of me. I have it at an angle on purpose. And I'm wearing what I'm wearing on purpose. This is not by accident. I'm wearing uh, this vest, white shirt, bolo tie, my Indiana Jones hat, because I'm trying to give you an impression of what sort of person I am while I do these reviews. I'm not acting, but I am trying to give you the impression, which is true, I am kind of a folksy guy who is giving you a review from a place that you don't usually get them. And hopefully, I'm coming off as a relatively intelligent guy because Nebraska represents, so, uh, you know, that's what I'm trying to give you. Uh, always, a costume should tell you something about the person wearing it. Now, in this case, the costumes were period costumes, costumes that were made up of things that people of that era would have worn. I don't know if the individuals wearing these particular costumes always wore these types of clothes, but they were appropriate for who the characters were. You know, the women were wearing the exact sorts of things that were tended to be very popular at that time, uh, not only in Great Britain, but also among the upper crest in the United States. These were the sorts of things that you would see. Um, no doubt their coloring and sort of the decorations and stuff like that were intended to make you feel a certain way about their character. Similarly, we see uh, the one that really popped out at me was Ryan. Um, he, looks, he looks to me quite dashing in his outfit here. I thought that was very nice. Uh, it's always interesting to me that they don't even try with the doctor. And um, that's another thing one wonders about when it comes to a female doctor. You see, a male doctor can get away with wearing a costume that may be kind of anachronistic in a given time period. Because really, with men, over a long period of time, unless you get back into things like togas and stuff like that, it was real standard for a man to have a shirt and, a, you know, and pants and maybe a jacket and maybe a tie and maybe a hat. But you get into women, it becomes problematic because you can get into time periods, Victorian era, for example, when the doctor's costume would be completely scandalous. Seeing that much of her legs, just what little you see, would be scandalous in Victorian era, England. This was not Victorian England, and you do see more of people's, you know, legs and skin, but not a ton more, you know. There are time periods when this costume is so anachronistic as it would be shocking. It would be something that old ladies would spit at you on the street because of you, were wearing, you were dressing like a complete slut, or you, they would assume that you were a whore because you were wearing the stuff. It's something they have to deal with, and they never do. Um, again, it's something men just don't suffer from for the most part. You can get stuff that's a little anachronistic, but if you're, if you're wearing a suit and a tie, you go back to 1950s, they wear suits and ties. You go to 2020, there are places where people wear suits and ties. You won't be questioned. Any time during that period, you can go back hundreds of years. And while the style itself may be very different, they'll look at you and go, that is the weirdest suit I've ever seen. They're not going to look and go, oh, look, a whore. You know, that, and that could happen to the doctor. But in any case, they overlook it here. It doesn't matter. It's like every time the doctor comes in with a weird costume, they just overlook it over completely. But the rest of the costumes, again, were all very, very good. And I, I do like the one particularly. For some reason, the one on Ryan just sticks out at me as being a good example of looking kind of dashing. Makeup designer for this episode was Claire Pritchard uh, Jones, as uh, she's been makeup designer for all of season 12 most of season 11 and off and on uh, all the way back to in Doctor Who all the way back to when she was a makeup artist on Dalek one of the first first season episodes now makeup falls into two different categories here and in this case makeup and costuming sort of overlap in places the first and what you think is the easiest stuff is the average person makeup the doctor Graham uh, you know the companions the other characters the thing about it is, this is 1080p, and that is really tough to pull off. You know, actors are human beings like anybody else. They have skin imperfections, you know, they may have a zit one day, you know, uh, they might have a mole, and all of this may need to be covered up with um, various types of makeup. Now, the problem is when they do it in 1080p, if they're working 
to cover something up really bad, it tends to look very caked on, and you can see it right in any given close-up. We don't see that here. We don't see it anywhere. And that means one of two things. Either they've hired nothing but actors that are, have pitch-perfect skin all the time, which is extremely unlikely, or the makeup artist is very, very good at hiding whatever imperfections they have without making it look caked on. So good on them. The other part of it, of course, is the Cyberman makeup, which also has to tie into the costuming. You know, the makeup and the costuming on that have to go hand in hand. And I should have mentioned the costuming. The costuming on that Cyberman was very good. It looked like a Dr. Sis, sort of a half-finished Cyberman. So that was real good. I, I like that very much, and the makeup worked well on that. And it's rare, of course, that with the Cyberman, it never happens. You can see in the Cyberman's actual face, you know, and so being able to see that face, uh, half of that face, and being, you know, sort of humanized with it, that worked well. You know, you almost thought, for a moment there, you almost thought between the acting and being able to see that face that maybe the Cyberman was going to go back to being a good guy, that there's some heart left in him, but of course, no, he's a Cyberman. There's no coming back from being a Cyberman. So, at the end of any review, we ask ourselves, is it any good? Well, yes, this is, this is a good episode. It's a, certainly a good setup for the next two episodes. It'll be the season finale. It does not have any of the SJW wokeness with its baseball bat whacking you across the head repeatedly to make sure that you got the message. It stands uh, as a pretty good episode throughout, particularly the fact that the Doctor is finding herself, whether she knows it or not, in a predestination paradox, because without the Doctor's presence, none of what happened that night would have come to pass, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein would never have happened. <laughs> but it is a good episode all around. It is a ghost story told from the perspective of British people. It is a British ghost story. And on that level, it works very, very damn well. It is a good episode. I wouldn't, unfortunately, say that it is a great episode. There are so many other episodes in non-Chibnall Who that I can point to and say, wow, this is a great episode. You know, Day of the Doctor. Best Doctor Who episode ever. But, you know, there are all kinds of other episodes that you can point to in other Doctors and say, wow, this is a great episode. This one was not a great episode, but it was a good episode. It was certainly something that I can recommend that you watch. And that is all that I've got to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks. I'll do my best to respond to you. So... Next time on the Fandime Master's Review of Doctor Who. In the far future, the Doctor and her friends face a brutal battle across the farthest regions of space. Now they must protect the last of the human race against the deadly Cybermen. That's next time on the Fandime Master's Review of Doctor Who. So, thank you for watching. That is all the time that we have today for this episode of Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.